All right, this is part 60 in the Mark series, and we're going to be in Mark chapter 14, verses 26 through 31. We're dealing with the moments before the betrayal and crucifixion of Jesus. These are very important things that the gospel of Mark is like, is embedding in the text that the Holy Spirit has inspired the author to put there so that we will learn. And I think the reason why I'm emphasizing this right now is I think that we sometimes read through these passages and we sort of skip over these things. We, we read them with casual eyes and we, we miss a lot of the gems and the important truths that are there and the application that it brings into our lives. So Mark 14, 26 through 31, we're going to look at uh, prophetic connections to the book of Zechariah. We're also going to be looking at why the failure of the disciples was important to include in scripture. Not only because there's lessons for us that we do need to learn about their failures and their failings because we're the, just like them, but also it provides historical evidence for the truthfulness of the death and resurrection of Christ. We'll get to that towards the end of the study. So I'm uh, Pastor Mike Winger, and most of you guys may already know this, but if it's your first time joining me for one of my studies or one of my videos, I try to help people learn to think biblically about everything because I really believe that the Bible is God's word, that he gave it to us. It's the greatest treasure we've got here, and it changes our lives in a million different ways. And when you start to see how beautiful it is and how wholesome and how wonderful and beneficial it is, you're, you're, you're going to be blessed. And that's my goal right there. I want to bless you. So let's read through the passage and then I have a quick announcement. But first, I want to get right into the word. Mark 14, 26, just as we read through the first time, what we typically do, we want to just load the ideas of the passage in our heads. We're gathering questions. We're just making observations. You're just noticing what the text of the scripture says. Here it says, and when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. And Jesus said to them, you will all fall away for it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. But after I am raised, I will go before you to Galilee. Peter said to him, even though they all fall away, I will not. And Jesus said to him, truly, I tell you this very night before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. But he said emphatically, if I must die with you, I will not deny you. And they all said the same. Now, what happens after, before this was the Passover meal. After this, they're going to be in the Garden of Gethsemane. That's where Jesus prays. And that's where Jesus is betrayed by Judas. So this is like that last moment, that last moment right there. This is, and this is what Jesus is focused on. His, his, the center of his thought is on the things that are about to happen. You're all going to fall away. And then the denial by Peter and the disciples. No, we're not. No, Jesus, we're not going to fall away. So, um, this, one of the things, I'll give you a spoiler for next week. We're going to get into this in more detail next week. One of the things we're looking at here is that Jesus is going to be utterly alone. Everybody's going to be um, either betraying him or denying him and leaving him utterly alone. The only faithful one in, in now in the garden being the faithful the faithful son of man where Adam in the garden was not. We'll get to that next week. That'll be that'll be then. But real quick, my announcement. I don't like interrupting Bible studies with announcements, but um, today I'm going to do this because, <clears throat> as you've noticed, I'm not live streaming this video. It's not live, although I'm probably going to put it on the same playlist because it should have been live. So I want people to be able to find it easily. But the reason I'm not streaming live is because my upload speed is is all messed up at home here and I've been working with uh, Spectrum to try to get it fixed and it's just taking a really long time to get it fixed. Uh, you can hold your advice. <laughs> we spent hours and hours on this. We've had the text out multiple times. We've changed out different devices. I've called other companies. Just hold the advice. Thank you so much for your help. But trust me, we've been flooded with emails and messages about it what people think I might be able to do to fix the problem. We're on the road to fix it. In the meantime, I'm just uploading content. You may see less videos from me, particularly Friday live stream. That won't happen if I don't have a good upload speed and can't produce good quality video. Last week was really cruddy. <laughs> the, the screen kept freezing. So there's my, my quick announcement. Um, in the meantime, nothing bad has happened. Nothing weird's going on. Just going to be a little less content until we get that fixed. All right, here we are, <clears throat> Mark 14, 26. It says, uh, leading us into this, we went through this last week, so I'm just going to mention it for setting the stage, setting the stage for where we are here in the Gospel of Mark. And when they'd sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. So they just finished the Passover meal, they sing a hymn. We talked about the prophetic implications of that hymn, very likely Psalm 118, maybe Psalm 116, going to be in that range of Psalms, probably most likely Psalm 118. We talked about that all last time around. This time, we're going with Jesus on his journey from Jerusalem, from where they had Passover, the meal, to the um, to the Mount of Olives where Jesus is betrayed. And on the way there, at some point on the journey, he says to them, you will all fall away. All of you are going to fall away for it's written, I will strike the shepherd. Let me come back to that verse that he's quoting. He's actually quoting Zechariah. But first, let's talk about this phrase, you will all 
fall away. Now, in the in the Greek, that word fall away, right, this, I mean, it's like, it basically connects to our English word apostasy, <laughs> but it doesn't mean you're going to apostatize. That's not exactly, we shouldn't, we shouldn't go that route with it. A lot of times people recklessly use Greek on people who don't know Greek. <laughs> and so they, I call it pulling the Greek over your eyes when they sort of go a little too far with what Greek says. But there is a connection actually to something that's pretty interesting. And that is earlier in Jesus's um, Proverbs, when he talked about the parable of the soils and these, it was an analogy Jesus gave where there's these four different kinds of soils in Mark chapter four, and they represent different kinds of hearts that people have when they hear the word of God. And so the good soils, like the person who receives it and believes, but one of the soils represents people who fall away. And it's the same word Jesus uses here. Notice why they fall away. Verse 16, these are the ones sown on rocky ground, the ones who, when they hear the word, immediately receive it with joy. Well, that would be perhaps the disciples. They did receive the word with joy. They heard it and they were even preaching it and they were even doing miracles in Jesus' name, all these great things. And they have no root in themselves, but endure for a while. Then Jesus diagnoses why they fall, why they fall away. Then when tribulation or persecution arises on account of the word, immediately they fall away. Now, this is like quite literally what, I mean, I'm, I'm just saying there's a parallel here in the gospel of Mark. Jesus uses the term fall away. He previously described people who fall away because of persecution and tribulation. And I think that this is central to the lesson we're getting from the betrayal and the denial of Christ from the disciples, the betrayal by Judas denial from the other disciples, that the lesson is if you aren't ready to be persecuted and suffer, if you've received the word with joy, but you're not ready for suffering, if you're not equipped and prepared mentally with the idea that tribulation and persecution is a real legit thing you're going to experience, you're even called to sometimes, then you may actually fall away as a result. So the lesson is this, is that my attitude, this a spoiler, this is, this is a major part of the study today, a major part of, I think, what we're getting in Mark 14. My attitude towards suffering reveals something about the genuineness of my faith, which, which means this, like Peter, you may overestimate your own faith, but it's possible that when you go through hard times and you find that your faith is very small, and I don't mean this in a hard sense because I have found this true of me, but you may find that your faith was always that small. You just didn't realize it was that small because it hadn't been pressed on so hard before. We learn our strength when we sort of max out. Like some guys go to the gym and they max out. This is when they're going to they're gonna say bench press the maximum they can bench press. That's how they learn the limits of their strength. But sometimes in life, we're going through trials that are like lesser. <laughs> They're not as big of a thing. And we find out how strong we really are when we have heavy trials that we're trying to lift and go through. So Peter, he's going to boast about how confident he is, but he ends up falling very much short of this. And our attitude, really, our attitude when we suffer, when we're going through, not just our attitude about the idea of suffering, but our attitude when we suffer, it reveals a lot about where our faith is at. Now, maybe that means that your faith is weak. Maybe like you, you're like, I, I'm gonna, I've faltered, I've failed. And Jesus welcomes you back just like he did with Peter. So this isn't meant to be condemnation. It's just meant to be awareness. Boy, there's something perhaps missing in, in, in my heart here when it comes to how I, I view pain and suffering. And this is a dividing line for many of us on our walk with Christ. So Jesus actually has been trying to get this into the hearts of the disciples throughout the gospel of Mark. He, throughout the gospels period, he tries to get into their hearts the idea that suffering is part of the deal. And one of the ways he tries to get it through them is as he's repeatedly said in Mark, I'm going to suffer, I'm going to die. Peter, the same guy who won't be able to handle his own suffering, didn't want Jesus to go through suffering either. When Jesus says, I'm going to be killed and rise, Peter's like, no, Lord, no, no, that will never happen. And He's going to have a very different attitude in a very short period of time because something radically wonderful happens to Peter real soon. But in Luke 9, 23, Jesus is again trying to like, I think, drill this into us. Like as a Christian, this, this, our attitude towards suffering. I, I'm going to read this to us and then I want to comment on, I think, how sometimes in trying to present the gospel to the world, we take away some of these things that Jesus was emphasizing because we realize that it's an obstacle. Um, but in, in all reality, Jesus emphasized it because it was an obstacle. Like that's why it was emphasized. Whereas we're wanting to de-emphasize it because it's an obstacle. This is a weird cultural thing we're doing. It's not real consistent with our actual gospel message. But in Luke 9, 23, he says to them all, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. 
This is a, you know, we, we hear these words, we know these words, we've heard these words before, but what I'm going to suggest is that this is a way more extreme statement than most of us realize off just sort of glancing at it. Jesus is telling you, if you want to follow him, here's the calling that you're going to be taking upon you to deny yourself, deny yourself. Like there's one thing I don't really want to deny. It's me. It's what I want. It's what I desire. These are things I don't want to deny. And I don't just mean sinful things. Yes, of course, there's a call to turn from sin, but there's even like a self-denial that's there where it's just like being willing to lack or lose things for the sake of the name of Christ. And he says, take up your cross and follow me. But the cross is a a device of shame back then. Let me remind us, because we're so 21st century that we just don't recognize these things. The cross was a terrible, shameful thing. If you were crucified, it was shame for you and for your family. If you were crucified, it was considered the most embarrassing, not just painful, but embarrassing way to die. In fact, the the early authors in the first century and, and around that time they wouldn't like to use the word crucify. They would like to substitute it with other words. This is what we do with words where we're very uncomfortable. Like if somebody you love dies, you may say they pass away. And this is a gentle way of saying, I don't want to use that word. It hurts to say that word. This is how it was with the word crucify. They would often use the term something like the, the extreme punishment, the extreme penalty. We read about that in one of the historians from back then. They didn't even like using the word. Do you get the idea that the, the social consciousness back then is suggesting that a cross is a shameful thing? Now, in that milieu, in that like environment, sorry, I'm looking for a better word. In that environment, Jesus says, take up your cross and follow me. He's saying, take up your rejection, your shame from the world, your, your perhaps punishment and follow me. Those are extreme words. Jesus wants us to know, <clears throat> and now I want to comment on our current presentation of the gospel real quick, just briefly, because it just happens to cross into what we're studying in Mark today. We sometimes want to present the gospel as if the whole message of the gospel is God loves you. God loves you. He has a wonderful plan for your life, which I think is true. I'm not actually bothered by people saying that. It's not the inclusion of God's love and God's wonderful plan that is a problem. It's the exclusion of take up your cross and follow Jesus. That's the part that's a problem. Uh, modern times, we we would, perhaps if we just went with our gut, if we, if we wrote a gospel with our hearts, with our hearts based on what we thought was most useful, we would produce a gospel that had far less suffering and just more affirmations of love. And I think that, that it was, uh, there's a similar parallel issue that disciples are going through that we're going through today because people are people. We always do this. We just recycle the same problems every generation, right? So the disciples are trying to, confront or will be forced to confront the fact that they have to suffer to follow Jesus, that they have to view this world as loss. doesn't mean you don't care about things in this world. You care very much, but you care about them in a new perspective, in the perspective of their eternal value and in perspective of what is what is uh, important in the eyes of God and not just to get along with man. And so we, we need to tackle the same problem they're tackling. And that's one of my goals today is as we read through where they failed, and we recognize this is their failure is the same as my failure if I don't watch myself. You know, I could deny Christ like Peter. That's the point. I could deny Jesus like Peter too. And I could affirm all day long I would never ever do it. But that's no protection against anything. Because Peter did the same thing. So we, we, uh, we look on. Mark is showing us then a few things. Uh, the suffering of Jesus was central and necessary. And two, yours is as well. Your suffering is as well. Uh, your suffering is not the thing that's causing you to get salvation or earning it with pain, but rather it is the it is the thing that you'll look at that will cause you to decide whether you're genuine in your faith towards God and Christ. You'll look at that suffering and you'll make a new decision whether you're going to really follow or not. So first, as a Christian, just like the Gospels, first you're trained to embrace Christ's suffering. This, um, this is a big reveal moment, okay? Forgive me if I'm not setting it up as properly as I should. Big reveal moment. The Gospels are teaching them to embrace the suffering of Christ that they then might be able to embrace their own suffering so that they will simply follow in the steps of Christ even as they go through hard times in life with hope for the future and confidence in the hardships and the pains that they're presently in right now. I really hope I'm communicating this well. Our attitude towards Christ and his suffering then becomes our attitude towards our suffering. And so we're then ready. Like Peter, we're then ready after the fact to actually move forward. So the um, 
the, the other thing I want to talk about, or, well, several things I want to talk about today, but one of them is I want to mention the connection between Mark and Zechariah, or I should really say not just between Mark and Zechariah, but between like what we call the Passion Week of Jesus, this this last week, the last several days leading up to and including the cross, then you have his resurrection. These moments in this period of time, this last like week of Christ's earthly ministry, this time is connected to the book of Zechariah in a lot of ways, particularly Zechariah chapters 9 through 14 like the second part of the book of Zechariah. It's noted that the, this part of Zechariah is like different than the rest of Zechariah. And it's also noted that there's just heavy messianic stuff going on in Zechariah. So uh, I'll give you an example. We've already got one. I won't go into detail, but we've already got one of these references between um, the Passion Week and Zechariah in the Gospel of Mark when we hear about Jesus going in on a donkey to Jerusalem to proclaim himself as Messiah. One of the ways they knew what Jesus was doing was they knew Zechariah 11 verses 1 through 10. That gives this description of, you know, your king is coming to you lowly and on, on a donkey. So we have this coming from Zechariah. Then we have in Mark 14, 24, an additional reference to Zechariah, whereas Jesus is talking about his blood of the covenant. And this connects to Zechariah 9, 11. I talked about this last time in our Mark study, so I won't go into detail. I just want to draw out multiple connections to the book of Zechariah, which then somebody who loves the idea of Jesus in the Old Testament makes me want to go and look and see what else is in Zechariah. So I want to kind of like spur that um, that idea right now, because in Mark 14, 27, a verse we're in today, let me show it to you real quick. In Mark 14, 27, we have another reference to Zechariah and uh, oops, I'm in Mark 4. There we go. And Jesus said to them, you will all fall away for it is written. And that's just a quote from Zechariah. I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. Okay, so this is, there's layers of interesting things happening with this little phrase from Zechariah. Let me talk about some of those things. And it's going to be another one of those, but wait, there's more type moments as we study the gospel of Mark. So here's, here's one of them. Uh, Zechariah is being quoted, but notice it's, it's going to be quoted a little differently, a little differently than it reads in our translation of Zechariah. 13, 7. Notice Jesus says, I will strike the shepherd. Okay, I will strike. This implies that it's God himself who's doing the striking of the shepherd. But when you look at Zechariah 13, 7, it, it's worded slightly differently. Awake, O sword, against my shepherd, against the man who stands next to me, declares the Lord of hosts. Strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. Okay, there's the eye is not there, right? Strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. This is um, this is exactly where some people who would perhaps on their radar is worries that like maybe the New Testament authors didn't use the Old Testament properly, that kind of thing. And maybe they've even been told this by somebody who they think knows what they're talking about. And, and I've heard this from people who otherwise do know what they're talking about. But it's better than that. Usually when you think that the New Testament's misusing the Old Testament, all that it takes is a more careful study of that Old Testament passage and how it's being used and then you go, oh, they just weren't doing what I thought they were doing, right? For instance, Jesus here is not just quoting it. He's summarizing it, uh, right? In the passage, who's responsible for striking the shepherd? Let's talk about this. Uh, Awake, O sword, against my shepherd. Okay, God is the one speaking here in this prophetic passage in Zechariah. And he's the one calling the sword to become awake and to strike the shepherd. That means that God can, give, can be given credit for the striking of the shepherd because it's at his command. There's nothing weird about that. There's no like hermeneutical gymnastics taking place in, the, in this situation. What Mark is doing, instead of quoting the whole section, he's recording Jesus having quoted just the summary. I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. Meaning that not only is that consistent with the Old Testament here, that, that, it's, that it's God who at his command, the shepherd's being uh, stricken, but it's also an emphasis with Jesus that it's God's divine intention for him to be killed. This is important because Jesus does this in Mark over and over again. This is like a layer of meaning in the gospel of Mark now. He wants us to know that it's God's intention and plan for Christ to die for us. It's not just happening on accident. It's deliberate. It's planned. It's purposeful. That doesn't mean everybody involved is a good guy. Judas is definitely a bad guy, right? The the leaders betraying Christ and, and trying to get him killed, they're definitely playing a bad role. But the whole thing is according to God's plan and agenda. Why do I bring all this up? Well, one, it just it's an interesting layer of meaning here in the Gospel of Mark. But also, there are those who nowadays want to say that God had nothing to do with the death of Jesus. Um, I, I, I can think of a quote from, I, I don't know if, 
I don't remember for sure who this is from. It might be Steve Chalk or Greg Boyd or Brian Zond or one of those guys who all kind of have, they're very different people. They have different views on different things, but they all have a similar view on this. And they would say, God didn't kill Jesus. We did, right? God didn't kill Jesus. We did. Now I would say the first part of that statement is wrong. And the second part is true, Like, right? Well, we, we did like humans did, we're, we're guilty of this, but it was also God's intention and plan to do it. And Jesus wasn't afraid to put, I will strike the shepherd in the mouth of God. Okay. Because, and Jesus, of course, he's God with us. He knows the intentions that God has. So uh, that being said, yes, it's man did it, but God was behind it. And that's actually intentional. Part of that is actually not for a lesson just about the atonement and what the cross means, but also about the centrality of God's use of suffering in, in Christ's life. So we'll know he's using suffering in our lives too right? Then you can have more hope and more comfort and more confidence. But there's more. Okay, so Zechariah has tons of content about um, the Messiah. And it's really interesting if you read it, if you just read through Zechariah 9 through 14, just kind of plow through it, you will find that this, this section of scripture is kind of spaghetti when it comes to the Messiah. What I mean is this, there's an old book um, called... Um, I, well, is it the name of the book? I never read the book. I just heard someone talking about it. I thought it was an interesting point they made about how men are like waffles and women are like spaghetti. Okay, whether you agree with this or not, I don't care. It's just an analogy. So uh, men are like waffles. The idea is that men are thinking like waffles are in little boxes. Everything's segmented out. And men tend to be more like compartmentalized thinkers according to this analogy. And women are more like spaghetti. So perhaps this is why I can like ponder one particular problem for a long period of time. Whereas like... I. I won't realize I'm, I'm double scheduling my calendar. You know? And then, and that's, that's where you realize one thing's connected to another. So, you know, I'll mention a calendar date to my wife and she's going, Oh, well this date, you know, we can't do this because we're also doing that. And, because, and we're doing that because this other thing's happening and my family, this and your family, that. And so she knows all that's going on with more of, of a spaghetti spaghetti and waffles here aren't better or worse. They're just different. Waffles stick to one topic, spaghetti, see how everything interconnects. Okay, so that's the analogy. And, and I, I labor at that just to say this, that uh, Zechariah strikes me as spaghetti. As you read through this whole Jesus through Zechariah 9 through 14, it's as though God is dealing with two things at once. He's dealing with uh, the people returning from the exile and he's dealing with the people of Israel. So there's a lot of stuff that's very, <clears throat> very present, very meaningful to them right at the moment. But woven through that, is this thread of the Messiah that just keeps bouncing up and, and cropping up. And then he speaks of the second coming of Christ and the first coming of Christ right next to each other, which is pretty common in the Old Testament to not make clear the difference between the first and second coming. This is, in all honesty, for those who, who you, you're prophecy fans, I think that was intentional. I think God didn't want to make clear the difference between the first and second coming so that the first coming would be a mystery revealed, right? It's all there. It's just not clear exactly the order of events so that it, you go, oh, I get it. Uh, anyway, that's another longer video to talk about that. But um, let me talk about some of the spaghetti that's weaving through Zechariah 9 through 14 as you read through these things. Let's look at Zechariah 11 verses uh, 12 through 13. It says, um, then I said to them, if it seems good to you, give me my wages, but if not, keep them. And they weighed out my weight as my wages, 30 pieces of silver. Then the Lord said to me, throw it to the potter, the lordly price at which I was priced by them. Now, this is super interesting for a number of reasons, uh, but let me, let me just point out a few. Okay, connecting Zechariah to Judas, ultimately. Judas actually um, sold Christ for 30 pieces of silver. Then, what, what's Zechariah told to do with this really random, strange, prophetic thing here? It says, throw it to the potter. I throw it to the potter. Well, according to the, the the New Testament, Judas, the money, the 30 pieces was actually used to purchase a potter's field. But what's weird about this is that there's a debate over who really owned the field. Did Judas own it or did the priests own it? Because Judas, according to one passage, he bought with act in Acts, he bought a field with the money he received from betraying Christ. So he threw it to the potter, so to speak. But in another passage in the Gospels, we have Judas taking the money and throwing it down into the temple. He hangs himself and then the, the priests use the money to buy the field. So who bought the field? Judas or the priests? And then you have this strange occurrence back hundreds of years before in Zechariah eleven thirteen. 
Now, some people think this is a, a, a contradiction in the Gospels. I actually think this is a, a beautiful um, s- fulfillment of Zechariah 11. And, and, it, and it'd be hard to say it was intentionally written that way because it does come off as like a strange way of telling the story in two different accounts that only is harmonized right here in Zechariah. So it says, um, he throws it to the potter, took it to the took the silver, and I threw them into the house of the Lord to the potter, which is a weird, weird statement. I took the money and I threw it into the temple, the house of the Lord, to the potter. What does that even mean? How do you throw money into the temple to the potter? What does that mean? Potters are not operating in the temple. But sure enough, Judas takes the money, throws it. <clears throat> the high priests take the, the, the money. They say, we, they go, it's unlawful to bring this money into the treasury because it's blood money. So then they use the money to buy a field. But if the money was never brought into the treasury, it's never officially temple money, which means the money still belongs to Judas which means they bought the potter's field for Judas. And how did he get it? He threw the money into the temple. And I'm just like, like, I think that's just really neat. Really neat. What, what first looks like a contradiction to people is actually better than that. But there's more. Okay, so um, in the context of Zechariah 11, there's like a flow of thought that happens. Let me actually bring it back up for you. Zechariah 11.10, let me talk about this sort of flow of thought. God says, I took my staff favor and I broke it crack, annulling the covenant that I had made with all the peoples. Okay, so God's annulling this covenant that he's made with Israel. So it was annulled or removed. He'd break it. He's, he's like, it's over. The covenant's over. And uh, the sheep traders who were watching me knew that it was the word of the Lord. Okay, so there's this covenant that's being broken. Then as you read on in chapter 11, you're going to see that he's going to he's going to punish the people. They're going to suffer. Their 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 shepherds in particular, woe to the worthless shepherd who deserts the flock. He's like taking he's going to take a sword and kill the worthless shepherds. There's basically judgment coming upon the people of Israel because of their betrayal of the covenant of God which is now broken. Okay, that's step 1 and 2. Covenant broken, judgment's coming, your shepherds are going to die. So then this is this is where it starts to take on this sort of substitution, Jesus coming in and standing in, in our place kind of flavor in Zechariah. So their lost hope, their pain that they're going to suffer, you could read through Zechariah on your own, it shifts in Zechariah 12.10. All of a sudden, there is this new covenant, that there's this new um this fixing of the covenant, I'll put it that way in Zechariah 12, we get the statement that he's going to fix the covenant. And then we have this, the benefits of the fixed covenant. I will put out on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem, this, a spirit of grace and pleas for mercy so that when they look on me, whom they have pierced, they shall mourn for him as one mourns for an only child and weep bitterly over him as one weeps for, uh, over a firstborn. So this, there's going to be like a, a restoration that's going to happen. Okay. What happens in between? Well, what, what ultimately happens in between this is that the the shepherd who actually takes the punishment isn't the people of Israel, it's Jesus. Let me see if I can uh, explain this in a way that might be less spaghetti than I already am. Hey, Israel, covenant's broken, judgment's on its way. I'm going to strike your shepherds. And then, who gets stricken? Who gets struck? It's God's shepherd. It's not their shepherds, right? But it's God's shepherd. It's one shepherd who is close to God. In fact, in Zechariah 11, verses 12 and 13, let's look at that one more time. Then we'll come back to the him who they pierced passage. Zechariah eleven twelve. Then I said, if, um, oh, I'm sorry. That's not the verse. Uh, Zechariah 13, 7. Excuse me. This is uh, after the declaration of the judgment that's coming upon them, the breaking of the covenant, the judgment on their shepherds. Then it's awaken, O sword, against my shepherd, against the man who stands next to me. Now, this man who stands next to me, is. these are positive terms. These are terms of closeness. And so one will be stricken, one will be killed, one will be slain. That's what the sword represents is the death penalty and, and death in general. And so the sword's going to kill this shepherd, but it's, he's, he's like a good shepherd. He's like God's shepherd. Judgment belongs to Israel. It's hanging over their heads. And then there's judgment falling ultimately on Jesus. And Jesus claims this verse about himself. That's pretty powerful. That's pretty interesting stuff. And then we get to um, Zechariah 12.10. It results in the pouring out of the Spirit. This is the look on me whom they've pierced verse, which is super interesting. So the benefits of the Spirit being poured out, and they're going to have mercy and grace. They're going to have forgiveness. But that's when they look on him who they've pierced. Who they've pierced. They mourn for him as one mourns for an only child. And... The interesting thing about this to me is that in Zechariah 12.10, the one who they're looking on is God, right? God's going to pour out his spirit 
And they're going to look on God who they pierced. Because the shepherd takes the place of those who deserve to be punished in Zechariah is actually God himself. And they're going to look upon him and that's when grace will be poured out upon them. Then we have Zechariah 13, 1. Where it says, in that, on that day there shall be a fountain open for the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem to cleanse them from sin and from uncleanness. And we can connect this to Jesus' talking about him being the fountain, right? Water of life's going to come out of me. That's going to be me. It's all about Christ. He's the, he's the one whom they pierced. He's the shepherd who is strick, uh, struck. Strucken? Strickled. I don't know. And then Jesus is the, the one who is the fountain of, of living water for us, right? As he says in the Gospel of John, um, uh, he who believes in me out of his innermost being will flow rivers of living water. Jesus is talking about himself in this case. So th that to me is neat. I think Zechariah has like layers all connecting to the ministry of Jesus, but not just what he does, but rather what it means, what it means. Like the particulars about the betrayal of Christ, the amount, what's done with the money, but also what it means. Jesus dies in my place. He suffers the penalty I deserve so that grace can be poured out when I look upon him, right, who I pierced. Because it's ultimately my sin that is responsible for his suffering. I think it's beautiful. Beautiful stuff. So Zechariah gives us like the triumphal entry, the betrayal of Christ, the reason why he's suffering, the grace and mercy that's poured out afterwards. This is all right there, kind of spaghetti through uh, Zechariah. Neat stuff. Let's, let's move on to Mark 14, 28. And Jesus then says... Um, Okay, so I will strike the, the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered, but after I'm raised, I will go before you to Galilee. So this is a passage where Jesus once again is speaking of his resurrection. And we'll talk more about this later, but there's a common misconception that is propagated by um, just generally by skeptics online. Uh, and, and I don't have anything against skeptics, okay? Like, I'm talking about the issues, not the people. Look, love the people. But on these topics, there's certain sort of misconceptions that just float around a lot online. One of those misconceptions is that the Gospel of Mark has no resurrection if you don't take the last 12 verses of Mark, right? There's a debate on whether the last 12 verses of Mark belong originally in the passage. Now, if you don't grant those, then people will say, therefore, there is no resurrection in Mark. And that's so far from the truth. These people are not reading Mark carefully at all. Uh, Jesus predicted his resurrection in Mark 8, 31, 9, 31, 10, 33, and 34. He pre predicts it again here and arranges a meeting in Galilee that they're going to have. We'll talk about that in just a second. Plus, uh, later on in the Gospel of Mark, we actually have narrated that Christ has risen from the dead. So for those who suggest that, that Mark has no resurrection, they like, they like to do it this way. They go, Mark's the earliest of the Gospels. Mark has no resurrection. And then the implication people often seem to want us to think is that therefore the resurrection of Christ was sort of invented later on like a church tradition, but it wasn't part of the original story. But yet here in the earliest of the Gospels, we have the resurrection being absolutely central to the death of Christ, his resurrection, absolutely central. But there's another problem for, for people who have these views, and that is that Mark is not the earliest information we have about the church. We know for certain, for to any degree of historical certainty that's reasonably you know, reasonable to look for. We know that Christ and his death and resurrection were being preached from Jerusalem right, right after the event supposedly, even if you're a skeptic, you want to say supposedly took place. The death and resurrection of Christ were central to the beginning of the church. This is not a new thing. This didn't develop over time. This was central right away. The earliest text we have in the New Testament is actually about this is 1 Corinthians 15, which records a creed that, that most scholars think was in circulation within a few years, for sure, within a few, it could have been even earlier, but it would have had to have been within circulation at least, you know, or most eight years after the death of Christ. And this creed involves his death and his resurrection and the eyewitness appearances, including, and let me share this one with you because it relates to Mark. I'm being a little bit spaghetti today, I admit it, but it's because sometimes it's good to do that. Um, this creed, it relates not only, right, I delivered to you uh, as a first importance what I also received. This is a Jewish way of saying, here's our, here's our creed. I, I'm, it's a little bit of a clumsy word, but to give a short explanation, I'll use that term. Here's our creed. It's, it's, it's sort of written down like this is our official thing that all of us agree on in our beliefs. And we've been giving it to you since the very beginning, right? That Christ died for our sins according with the scriptures and that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, and then to the twelve, then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Now, many have pointed out 
historically speaking, apologetic moment here, um, defending the Christian faith, right? The, the, the truthfulness of it, the historical veracity of the resurrection, that this group of people, the Corinthians, Paul, the, the, the most obvious reading of this passage is that Paul thought they still had access to a very large number of eyewitnesses of Jesus's resurrection. And he speaks to them. Some have fallen asleep, meaning they died. This is a euphemism for they had passed on. They had gone to be with the Lord. But he's like, over 500 at once. Like, this would be a mass hallucination on, on scales that are completely irrational um, if it's not just an actual resurrected Christ. So he appeared to people who knew him, people who followed him, large groups of people. This is pretty strong historical evidence for the resurrection. But here's why I share it. Um, going back to Mark... We might have a clue as to where this giant 500-person gathering took place. Jesus says, I will go before you to Galilee. Jesus actually planned one of his resurrection appearances. Most of the time when Jesus appears to the disciples, it happens like in a closed room, they're, they're in hiding and he appears to them, or they're on the road to Emmaus and he just randomly appears. So it seems as though his appearances, his resurrect, re, resurrection appearances were generally unexpected. They were surprise appearances, but not the Galilee appearance. There is some arranged, scheduled event where they're going to get together and see him after he's raised in Galilee. Mark talks about this and the earliest of the Gospels. And then 1 Corinthians talks about an event where 500 at once saw him. It seems reasonable that the large 500 plus gathering happened in Galilee. I think that's pretty interesting. But there's also another point I want to draw out, which is this. The location of Jesus' ministry was focused in Galilee, not Jerusalem. You would expect it to be Jerusalem, but Jesus, I think, focused in Galilee because he's he's not centering Christianity in where uh, in a place where official Jewish approval is needed. In other words, it's fulfilling the Old Testament law, but it's not necessarily going to be headed up by the Jewish leaders. That's that's key. That's key. Instead, he's in Galilee, which scripture calls Galilee of the Gentiles, because the gospel is going to be universal. It's going to go to everybody in the world. And then after the resurrection of Christ, where does he meet all these people? In Galilee. And in Galilee, he commissions them. In Galilee, he, he reminds them of the mission and what the purpose is, because Christianity is meant for all people. It is Jewish in the sense that it, you know, our faith comes from this, this uh, deep and long, exhaustive you know, revelation of God in the Old Testament fulfilled by Christ. But it launches into the entire world to say, you know, there is in Christ, there's no Jew or Greek or, or slave or free or male or female or anything like that. So this could be like a subtle theological point God's trying to give us. The gospel's for all people, for all people. We don't need organizational approval from anybody. Just go preach the gospel, which of course... Um, uh, Goes real well with my Protestant views. <laughs> um, so there's another point uh, that we may miss, that we may miss in Mark right here. And that is Jesus, side by side, he talks about them being scattered, but then he talks about them being gathered again. Scattered and gathered. Um, it's just encouraging to me that God knows about your failings before they happen. And he's already had a plan for your restoration as well. And I don't know, I can't promise who's going to be receiving that restoration or who isn't because everybody's life is different. But it's just encouraging to me. If you failed, if you've fallen, if you've really radically backslidden and then later you come back and you return, um, it wasn't good, but God had a plan for that. And I, my encouragement to you is that he is he does want to regather you. He does want to bring you back, bring you back into the the group of believers, you know, who are loving, who love his name, uh, to bring you back into his, his arms, of embrace. I think that that's the good news there. He knows when, he knows when we're, we're going to scatter, but he also knows we're going to return uh, those of us that do anyway. There's another point. Um, no, I think I already said that point. All right, verse 29. Verse 29. I think I got ahead of my notes. Got excited. Verse 29 says, Peter said to him, even though they all fall away, I will not. And here's where we get, I think, um, a moment where we can often mock Peter. And, and it's not like pastors always do this, but it sometimes happens, not just pastors, but anybody where they kind of like, Peter becomes the butt of jokes, right? Like there was a nickname I heard for Peter um, when I was young, uh, still in the Lord. And it was uh, Big Mouth Peter, or Peter had foot and mouth disease, open foot, insert mouth. And these types of things are cute, but oftentimes when we try to make Christianity cute, we rob it of value. And what I'm going to suggest is that 
you and me are very possibly like Peter. Lord, even though they all fall away, I will not. And I, I can think especially the younger believers, the younger people. Uh, I know this could sound like an insult if you're young and you're hearing me. I don't mean it that way at all, right? Like sometimes those who are older, they they look back at young people as though they're inexperienced and as though there's a lot they don't know. Not because they're being mean and judgmental, but because they remember what they were like when they were that age. And they just they just think, the older I get, the more I'm kind of embarrassed about some of the stuff I thought and did back then. And so they, you know, they should be gracious and kind, but there's a weird thing in our society that acts like youth equals wisdom or, you know, like the younger a child is, the more you want to listen to their opinions about things. And, and I'm just like, I want to love them. I want to care for them. But like, you know, we're never more foolish than when we're one month old. And well, maybe when we're 12, we become more foolish. Um, but yeah, we all look back at our teen years and we all think we were just big dummies, you know, and, and that's just the reality. And you will too. You will too. If you're not there yet. And just knowing that can give you perspective. Okay. So recognize this. You might be newer in the faith and you may overestimate your own spirituality because you feel firm convictions. But convictions aren't battle wounds. Convictions aren't hard earned character. And Peter has convictions. Even though they all fall away, I will not. But he doesn't have that. He hasn't been through the trenches yet. And so he doesn't know what he'll do yet. He knows, he believes it. But what will he actually do? Well, Jesus says to him, uh, truly, I tell you, before this very night, before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. This would be hard to hear. Um, you know, what, I mean, what if Jesus told you, like, yeah, you're going to keep on failing in that area. You're just going to, no, I won't, Lord, I promise. No, you really are. Like this is, this is a difficult moment for Peter, I imagine, and it's public. And here it is recorded in the text of scripture, embarrassingly, and it's done for your good and my good, for your good and my good. Now, some suggest that are supposed, I'll, I'll mention briefly, I'm not going to get into a big contradiction here, uh, contradiction question here, but briefly I'll mention some suggest, okay, Mark has <clears throat> two times that the rooster is going to crow, whereas uh, the other gospels have the rooster crowing uh, one time. And I, this is an issue where I go, I don't think you need to spend a lot of time on this if this is something you as a Christian are wondering about. Uh, roosters were probably crowing all the time. So when they speak of a rooster crowing, you're speaking of probably more like when the morning comes or you're speaking of uh, certain points in time. One commentary says the roosters would typically crow like it was known a rooster crow would be at between 1 and 2 a.m. And then again, between 5 and 6. Jesus may have said the rooster crows twice. Okay, well, it's, this will be the second crowing, which will be at between 5 and 6 a.m., so around morning. And then the other Gospels are offering a, a truncated, simplified version of this saying, you know, before the rooster crows, implying morning time. Different ways of saying the same thing. It may simply be that. I don't really think this is much of an issue to worry about personally. Um, verse 31, but Peter kept saying insistently, insistently, let me put it on your screen there. Even if I have to die with you, I will not deny you. And they were all saying the same thing also. Now, here's what I want you to ask. Was Peter knowingly lying? I don't think he was. I think it makes a lot more sense that Peter really meant it. He really believed that he was willing to die for Christ. But he was wrong. He was wrong. And this gives me a, a moment to have humility. I really believe that I'm confident in this way and I'm strong in this and that, but there's almost more safety in not over, being overconfident about your own abilities or your own convictions or your own strength. It's almost like safer to just say, ah, oh, Lord, I'm weak. I'm just going to trust in you. You know, give me strength. Give me strength. In fact, when they're threatened in the book of Acts, Peter himself is the one who leads the prayer after they get threatened and, to, and beaten for Jesus' name. And he prays, God, give us boldness that we might speak forth the word of Christ. He prays for boldness, whereas here he, he's proclaiming boldness. And that might be the difference that humility is. Humility give, makes us pray for the thing that pride would have us assume we've already got. And so he's praying for boldness here as opposed to just saying he's got it here. Um, one thing you could say is don't boast about things you haven't gone through. And there's there's wisdom there. There's wisdom there. Um, you know, sometimes we can see somebody going through a trial that we're not experiencing. And we can think, 
come on, man. Like, come on, snap out of it or get up and, and go do what you need to do or, you know, act better. And maybe we're even right that they should do all those things, but we can become a bit callous because we just haven't been through that before. Like we're just, we think, we tend to think deeply about our own trials and sometimes we think very shallowly about other people's trials. I think maybe this is a human thing. I just haven't experienced that. So I don't know what it's like. So to me, I have like a cartoon version of what you're going through in my head. So my counsel to you can be poor. Um, that can that can be the case. And <clears throat> I think that to him, he has a cartoon version of what it means to die for Christ. But it's not just like a, maybe cartoon version is too, too strong. I think Peter was willing to die with Christ in a certain way. I think Peter, and, and I'm going to say this, I, I think, call me sexist if you like, but I think this is kind of perhaps a guy thing. Not like only guys, but I think guys tend this way. Dying in a blaze of glory is not the same as suffering shame, embarrassment, and confusion, and weakness, and then dying. God, I will die for you. Peter obviously was willing to die for Christ in some sense, because guess what? When Judas comes, kisses, and betrays Christ, Peter pulls out his sword, and he starts hacking away at the people taking Jesus. Like, he's willing to, they're armed. He was willing to die there. He actually hacks off Malchus, the servant of the high priest's ear. Jesus heals it, stops Peter, says, if you take up the sword, you're going to die by the sword. That Peter, you're just going to die. It's interesting. He was willing to die, but only in a blaze of glory. And as a guy, I know the, especially when I was younger, <laughs> the idea of like jumping in front of a bullet to save somebody. I, I think I would have done that real quick, real quick. But the older I get, the more... I realize that sometimes suffering in, you know, it involves things that are embarrassing and shameful. And that's very different than a blaze of glory. Sometimes, you know, I'm like, God, I would die for you. I would die for you. Or remember I used to say to my wife, oh, honey, I would die for you. And yet, will I die to myself and exhibit patience towards my wife? Or will I jump in front of a bullet for her, but I won't turn a kind answer to her when she's in a bad mood? That's the kind of dying we're called to a lot of the time. Most of the time, the dying we do is mundane. It doesn't feel wonderful. It just feels like, oh, this is this is not what I thought it was going to be. When I was thinking of trials, I was thinking of something very different than this. Getting arrested for Jesus isn't the same as, say, being put in prison for him for 10 years. That's a different thing, isn't it? Standing before the court, getting arrested, that's one thing. Something else to remain faithful for those 10 years. I think Peter was willing to go out in a blaze of glory, but I don't think he was ready for the, embarrass the embarrassment of Jesus on the cross, the confusion that it caused, the weakness that he saw in Christ, and the shame that it put upon all of them that their Messiah leader was now on the cross, which he said he would be on, but they didn't really get it. I think we have to ask, like Peter, what is my attitude towards suffering really as a Christian? Um, I say this because I want to strengthen us. Like you and me both, we need this. Like I'm as human as you. And what I'll call nonsense suffering, suffering that at least to my perspective from, from this side of heaven, I look at it and I go, I can't even think of a reason why this would be happening. This bad thing, this hard thing, I can't even perceive of a reason. That kind of suffering, in my opinion, is the hardest to go through. And I think that's what Peter was going through when he denied Christ. I think it was the nonsense of it. This, this makes no sense. This conflicts with everything I expect and anticipate from the God I love and worship. I think that that revealed where his faith was really at. Now, the good news is Peter totally changed after the cross. When he embraced the idea of Jesus on the cross, he was then able to embrace the idea of himself on his, in his own suffering. So, he, so here's Peter. I mean, right after, literally right after the resurrection of Christ, Peter's a different guy. Um, you could say that he's filled with the Spirit. <clears throat> Absolutely true. He's also learned some real lessons. And this is Peter. Right now, we're going to look at 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3. Uh, and on through nine. This is Peter <clears throat> after this transformation has taken place. Look at his attitude towards, towards pain now. And notice that it's all in context, not of an earthly messianic kingdom, but it's in context of the eternal glory that's coming. Suffering in context of eternal glory, it looks a lot smaller. Suffering in the context of just this earthly life will look a lot bigger, but um, I digress. Verse three, blessed be the God and father of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to his great mercy. He's caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled and unfading, kept in heaven for you. This is what's going to keep Peter going. This is what's going to keep us going. 
just like Jesus went to the cross, knowing that it would bring us into his eternal presence forever. So we need to go to our pain and our shame and our hardship, even the nonsense suffering, knowing that there's an eternal, unfading, imperishable, undefiled inheritance kept in heaven for us. Who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice, that is in our salvation, that, that wonderful salvation that's coming. Though now for a little while, if necessary, you've been grieved by various trials. May I mention a couple things? We go through various trials. That is random stuff. There's just try. There's just various. There isn't just one. It's not just persecution. We just go through various trials as Christians. As humans, we do. As Christians, I have a hope in Christ that I want everyone to have. But every human goes through various trials. right? And as I'm in these various trials, what is it doing? It's testing the genuineness of your faith. Do you see that? Peter made claims, I would die with you. Then he went through the hardship and the testing and he found out that his faith was weak, was very little. Just like Jesus had said, oh, you have little faith. Like that was true that whole time. And now Peter knows. But now after identifying with the death and resurrection of Christ, not just God's love, but the death and resurrection and the future glory that speaks of, Peter's like, I'm willing to suffer now. In fact, I see, I see suffering. I see various random trials, even nonsense suffering, or, you know, it looks like nonsense to us as the testing of the genuineness of our faith. Then he says that faith is more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire. And that, that, that faith we have, that it may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. And he goes on. Do you see this is a different Peter? Now, he's not just like, I'm willing to die with you. Instead, I'm willing to suffer because the eternal glory that's coming far outweighs all of this stuff. And I see my current suffering as a testing of my faith, a refining of my faith even. Peter had to learn this, but this is a big lesson for all of us. I think this is, notice this, the suffering and the confusion and the betrayal of the disciples is embedded in the resurrection, in the death, betrayal, and resurrection of Christ because we go through the same stuff. You come to Christ's cross and then you come to yours. This is how it is. Paul had to learn this stuff too. Let me just mention really quick in Acts chapter 9 verse 16, Paul is uh, discussed. God says of him, I will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. Imagine if this was spoken over you as you're beginning your new ministry. <laughs> I'm going to, God says he's going to show you how much you have to suffer for the sake of his name. Well, Paul, I think, was slow to receive this. I have a feeling he was. But he did learn it eventually. He learned that his suffering was something God was using for glory. God was using for his own good. In 1 Corinthians, excuse me, 2 Corinthians 12, verses 7 through 10, we read this. Listen to what Paul said, his attitude towards pain and suffering. And please apply this to you because it's really easy for me to apply this to my friends. It's easy to tell other people like, God's working in your life. I trust in what God's will is for you. Hang in there. Trust in him. Wait on the Lord. He'll strengthen your heart. It's easy to say those things to others. The real rubber meets the road when I apply it into the things I'm going through right now. Not hypothetical situations one day I might face. The stuff I'm facing right now. This is where I see my attitude towards suffering. And it's not meant to be hopeless. This is meant to point us in the right direction. Embrace it. Don't like it. Accept it. Here we go. Second Corinthians 12 verse 7. So to keep me from becoming conceited. Paul had a danger that his pride would overwhelm him and ruin his ministry. And to keep that from happening because of the surpassing greatness of revelations. Like he, he, he was, God used it greatly and this could have led to his arrogance and pride. So the solution is not like read this book on humility. Instead, a thorn was given me in the flesh. A messenger of Satan to harass me. To keep me from becoming conceited. I'm not going to discuss what this thing was. The point is, and I don't think Paul talks about it intentionally because he wants you to be able to apply it to whatever you're going through. So whatever the suffering is, it's some kind of very unpleasant thing. Three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, that it should leave me three times. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you for my power is made perfect in weakness. Paul, I know the enemy's involved in this. Somehow it's a messenger of Satan. But I'm involved in this too. And I'm keeping you weak so that you can be strong in me. I am using your suffering. And it's 
This blows my mind. Paul's pain and suffering protected his ministry from self-destruction because of his pride. I don't know what God's doing in your things you're going through, but I know that God's doing things in the things you're going through. I know that God is good in the midst of the suffering that we're experiencing today. And that one of the big revelations of the cross is that it changes us from hypothetically, I'm willing to go through anything for you, Jesus, to actually being willing to go through anything because you're with Jesus. Therefore, I will boast. Now, now look at his new attitude. I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Paul's boasting in his weaknesses. What he, what he means here is he's going to tell people, look at God still using me even though this is wrong with me and that's wrong with me. Look at, look at, look at what God is doing. These aren't weaknesses like I have all these sinful compromises in my life. These are rather things that are publicly embarrassing about him. Uh, you know, th this is like a, a great Christian leader talking about how they deal with serious depression. And then they're like, people are like, well, that's embarrassing, man. Aren't you not supposed to go through that? You know, and, and instead they're, they're like, you know, I'm going to talk about it because it shows that it's God's strength in me and not me. This is like a man who has like a weird, smelly thing going on with his face. Then he's going in public witnessing to people and then they're laughing at him because of his looks. And and this is God's strength being made perfect in our weakness. Um, it's actual weakness. For the sake of Christ, then I'm content. I am content. And, oh, God, give me the wisdom to be like this. And maybe I just need to learn through more suffering in my life. Maybe that's the case for you. But but can you pray, verse 10, God, I'm content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. Now, it's one thing to be content with, like, not enough money in life to get the things you would like. And just say, I'm going to be content with what I've got. The car I've got, the, if you even have a car, the bike you've got, the bus pass you've got. You're going to be content with, um, with whatever. Paul is going a whole step further and says, I'm content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. When these things are in my life, I'm okay with it. Why? Because when I'm weak, then I am strong. Paul's not okay because he's... He's like literally okay because he recognizes there's a benefit to these pains. There's a benefit to these pains. A really bad analogy of this in my own life was when I was a kid and I would get, I got the worst growing pains. Like in my legs, I'd feel real bad growing pains, you know. Um, some people never get them. I got them real bad. But I remember like laying in bed as a, as a child and thinking to myself, it's worth it if it gets me taller. I just want to be taller, you know, like, <laughs> I just want to be taller, you know, everyone's taller than me. I just want to be taller, you know, and um, at that age anyway. And I remember thinking it's worth it. It's worth it. And there was something that I tapped into there that is the very same thing here, that it's worth it. There's eternal glory coming through the pains I'm going through today. And it's not about me being taller, although my character grows, but it's also about the power of Christ resting on me. It's like, I, my weakness will be used by God for his glory. I just trust him in that. He used Jesus' weakness. He used Peter's weakness. He used Paul's weakness. He's using mine. In fact, he picked these guys and he put them through all kinds of hardship, partly just as a lesson to you and me. Learn that lesson. This is key. This is absolutely key. So um, let me mention really quick the historical evidence. Another apologetic moment because in this Mark series, I like to do theology Hist historical stuff, um, apologetics, and and just normal pastoral like encouragement for us, like what we've been getting just now. Hopefully, is encouraging to your heart. Give you give you some uh, some strength and weakness. I pray. But when it comes to apologetics or defending the Christian faith, uh, it's really interesting that these moments are included in the in the Gospels. We take for granted what's there. We just read it. It's there. We just we don't think much about it. But in the Gospels, we have horribly embarrassing stuff said about the disciples. In this case, here's a literally a conversation where Jesus tells Peter, right? Pretty important guy, right? Peter the apostle tells him, you're going to deny me. In fact, he tells all the disciples, these guys that are later running the church, running the church. And, and he tells them, you're all going to deny me. This is hugely embarrassing for them. They're going to go around like telling the story of their own embarrassment all the time now. Jesus says, you're going to betray me. Peter's like, I would die with you. Then Jesus says, you're going to deny me three times, Peter. Then, 
right? Peter goes out and he starts to, to pull out a sword and attack somebody embarrassingly. And later he's rebuked for it, even by Jesus. Jesus rebuking his own leaders. This is not the kind of thing you record unless it's true. That's the apologetic moment. When it comes to historical evidence, one of the things that people look for when they're examining history or say you're, you're a detective and you're looking at a, a <clears throat> an eyewitness to a crime or something like that. And when the eyewitness says something, <coughs> pardon me, says something like, <clears throat> I saw that guy, he killed so-and-so. And then you want to cross-examine him. Oh, yes. Uh, why were you even there in town, sir? And the man says, well, I was there. I was looking for a prostitute. And he's on... He's on, you know, the stand. He admits he was really there looking for a prostitute. And his wife is there in the room and she hears and she's shocked. Here's one thing the jury is all thinking at that point. Uh, the guy would not make that up. He really was over there looking for a prostitute. He's embarrassed. It looks bad for him. It causes him problems. He's probably telling the truth about his eyewitness testimony then. And this is what historians do as well. When they read embarrassing details written by people who, if they had leave that out. Or if they were making it up, they wouldn't make up this embarrassing thing. And we read about embarrassing things about the apostles all the time. People that the, the authors of the gospels either are them or they're followers of them, right? And they're not going to write these embarrassing things unless they are true. Now, here's where it gets better. Not only do we have the apostles fleeing, Peter denying, women finding the tomb empty, we'll talk more about that later. But these things are all <clears throat> happening around moments in the gospel that are historically essential to the truth of Christianity. So the death and resurrection of Christ is essential to the truth of Christianity. What's not essential to the truth of Christianity is like Jesus visited Tyre. Okay, that's not essential. Like there's there's an issue there that is not central to our faith. It's true, but it's not central to our faith. Jesus' death and resurrection, that's the whole story, right? Christianity stands and falls upon this. The most embarrassing moments in the gospels center around the death and resurrection of Christ. I think God is very clever and that he has not only embedded lessons for us all theologically, but he has embedded apologetic evidence, historical evidence into the testimony of the gospels as to the death and resurrection of Christ. The most embarrassing stuff happens around the most important historical events. Why? So that people who are doing honest inquiries into the historical evidence for the resurrection might be brought to Christ. I think that's pretty exciting. Really neat stuff. For today, apply it to yourself this way, I hope, and myself as well, is how do you handle suffering in your life? Um, will you accept that God's strength is manifesting in your weakness? Like this is actually a really, really big thing. And I don't know any, there's no formula for it. Like you literally just say, here's the areas of my life that are weak. Will I accept that God's strength is going to be manifest in these weaknesses? Right? Paul had to have a word from God about this. But I think that God's word to Paul is also God's word to you. So I think you have a word from God on this too. That his strength is made perfect in weakness. It, will you accept that? Will you even accept nonsense suffering with hope? Because I, I see Peter and the apostles watching Jesus on the cross. And to them it makes absolutely no sense. It's nonsense. But it would have been cool if they would have had faith still. And I would, I would recommend when you go through suffering that makes no sense at all. You don't have to figure out the answers. You just have to trust in God, right? When you don't know what is going on, you fall on the who, right? I don't know what this is, but I know who you are and I'm trusting you, God. Well, you know that your future is glorious because as a Christian, <clears throat> like Peter says later on in his epistle, you should never consider suffering apart from the glory that's coming. So if you look at this life, you may suffer 10 years, 70 years, 100 years, however long you live, you may suffer that whole time, but that is nothing in light of eternity. And, and so it, it changes your evaluation of all things when you see it in light of eternity. Now, this is not to say that Christians don't care about what happens on the earth. No, it's to say that we care about it in proper perspective, right? A, a first grader only knows first grade. All they care about is that day at school, but their parents with wisdom, they care about how first grade will affect third grade, will affect eighth grade, will affect college, will affect their career, will affect their entire life. They're thinking about all of that. That's wisdom to look at this life and say, this stuff going on has a bigger impact eternally. And I need to weigh that in if I'm going to be a wise person. And so always consider present suffering with future pleasure, joy, and peace in mind. And the other thing I'll encourage us with is just like Peter, um, we can, we can say what we want, but we kind of, we learn to suffer by suffering. If you're afraid of trials, they're going to come anyway. 
and you're just going to go through it. And that's how you grow. You just, you just learn by growing. You don't learn by just saying, okay, I'll, I, I got it. I'll never deny. I'll never back off. I'll never give up. <laughs> like you can say that all you want. You're just going to go through it. And then your faith is going to be tested. And then you're going to learn that growth that comes with pain. And if you have failed, finally, if you've failed, if you've blown it, if you, like Peter, you denied Christ, you turned your back on Christ, you are absolutely welcome back. You're, you are absolutely invited to be regathering back with the Lord right now, right at this very minute. Don't delay. Never believe any excuse that gives you reason to stay in your sin away from the Lord. Never, ever believe that stuff. Because in the end, I think the lesson is that uh, once you embrace the cross of Christ for him, and then you embrace that there's a cross for you, you cannot be beaten as a Christian. Because shame doesn't work on you. And we live, we live in a very much a shame culture nowadays. They want to shame Christians sometimes. And sometimes Christians want to shame others. And that's not the point. We don't want to, we don't want to live in that, that realm. But, um, but you can't be beaten if you're okay with being shamed. If you're okay with being hurt, persecuted, hated, ridiculed, confused. It's just, you just can't be beaten. And I, I think that we kind of need disciples like that nowadays. Big time. So thank you so much for joining me. I will hopefully be up live streaming again um, at least by next Monday. That's my hope and plan, although I can't promise anything. It just depends on how quickly this internet thing gets resolved. And um, yeah, so appreciate your guys' prayers on that. And if you have advice, just know I've been getting, we can't take any more emails. <laughs> so thanks anyways. Let me let me pray us out. Uh, Lord God, we ask for wisdom. Wisdom about our own lives, like actual real wisdom, like where it, where the rubber really meets the road, that we look at our pain, our confusion, our suffering, our, our, our weaknesses that we're going through, and we look at them in light of the cross of Christ, in light of the lessons you taught to Peter and Paul and us. We pray that we would be people who are truly mature, who look at the world in, in light of eternity, and who look at our current suffering in light of your glory and the work you're doing in this world through it. God, we want to be unbeatable. And for that, maybe we need, we need a beating. Maybe we need to suffer. We need to be brought low so that we can be content with it because that's where your power resides in us. So we submit ourselves to you. And we say, your will be done. Your will be done. We trust you and we thank you because you will put us through stuff that later we will thank you for. In Jesus' name, amen.